Hi, I'm Joe Alden, MD of Survival Top 50's Reader's Choice website, two years running, doomandbloom.net, with over a thousand articles, podcasts, and videos on medical preparedness. Together with my wife, Amy Alden, an advanced registered nurse practitioner, we're the authors of the 2017 Book Excellence Award winner in medicine, The Survival Medicine Handbook, now in its 700-page third edition. We're also the designers of an entire line of medical kits at store.doomandbloom.net. Recently, I connected with my good friend Dave Duffy, founder of Backwoods Home Magazine and also associated with Self-Reliance Magazine. If you're a homesteader, be sure to check out Self-Reliance Magazine. Anyway, Dave lives in Oregon, smack dab in the middle of the Cascadian Subduction Zone, a seismically active area north of the San Andreas and other California faults. Earthquakes and tsunamis cast a shadow on this beautiful landscape, and you know and I know that the number of casualties really could be significant if an event occurred there, especially if modern medical facilities are rendered inoperative in major population centers. Even in normal times, there are many areas in this part and many other parts of the country where the ambulance isn't just around the corner. On a drive from Portland to the coast, for example, you'll encounter a lot of territory where it's clear that medical help may not be right there if it's needed. Even when medical resources are available, multiple casualties spread out over a seismic zone, an earthquake area, might overwhelm medical personnel. A remote homestead may be too far away from the nearest health facility to make the difference between life and death. In addition, FEMA estimates that a full one-third of public safety workers will not report for duty in a disaster due to a failure of infrastructure and, maybe more likely, an understandable desire to protect their immediate families. If a major seismic event occurs in the Cascadia subduction zone, it's thought to be very similar to the earthquake and tsunami that occurred in Tohoku Oki, Japan in 2011. You'll remember the event for causing the meltdown of the nuclear plant at Fukushima. FEMA estimates that a similar earthquake in the Pacific Northwest would cause 13,000 fatalities and 27,000 injured, with even more injuries occurring during recovery and cleanup. The types of wounds incurred will include hemorrhages, sprains and fractures, crush injuries, and burns. Most non-traumatic injuries will be related to infections caused by the lack of safe drinking water and contaminated food. We've talked about all the rest in the past, so today let's concentrate on crush injuries. In the case of crush injuries, bleeding may present as severe bruising or an accumulation of blood in body tissues known as a hematoma. Direct pressure may help slow the bleeding, depending on where and how deep it is, but it's certainly less effective than when there is an actual skin breach that allows you to visualize and pack directly in the location of the hemorrhage. A large component of crush injuries are what we call compartment syndrome problems. Groups of organs or muscles are organized into areas called compartments. That is, they're supported by sections of walls of tough connective tissue called fascia. Compartment syndrome occurs when excessive pressure builds up inside these spaces due to the relative inflexibility of the fascial tissue in areas like legs, arms, and abdomen. As a result, muscles may swell or blood may accumulate in one or more of these compartments in a crush injury, and having nowhere to go, the increased pressure prevents good blood flow and deprives the area of oxygen. Damage to nerves and other tissues can result, leading to paralysis, organ failure, or even death. The first sign of compartment syndrome is severe pain followed by pins and needles sensations. The limb becomes swollen, shiny, loses sensation, and function over time. If the injury is confined to a small area, say only a part of the foot or part of the hand, damage to nerves and bones is a major risk. The effects, however, are generally local. When larger areas are involved, however, it can cause body-wide issues. The dilemma is that the victim is in danger while under the extreme pressure of the crush itself, but also when the pressure is released. The physical effects of releasing a person from the crushing object is sometimes called reperfusion syndrome. The toxins from dying muscle and tissue can not only cause paralysis of the affected area, but also overwhelms the kidney's ability to eliminate them. That could lead to renal failure. These toxins include things like potassium, and that, if it's released in large quantities throughout the body when pressure from a crush injury is released, causes life-threatening irregular heart rhythms. Remember the five P's of compartment syndrome? Pain, and lots of it at first, 
pale ashen skin, paresthesia, that's strange sensations like numbness, tingling, or pins and needles, pulse, or lack of it, or sometimes a very irregular heartbeat, and P for paralysis, that's the fifth P, due to nerve damage. It's a good idea to keep a crushed injury below the level of the heart to help aid in blood flow. If the affected area has been under crushing pressure for a short period of time, say 10 to 15 minutes, try to lift the weight off them. Longer than that, however, let emergency medical personnel make the decision. They often have to give IV hydration, oxygen, certain medications before removing the weight. Some recommend even the placement of a tourniquet above the injury as well to prevent toxins from flooding into the rest of the body. Once at the hospital, surgeons will often have to make an incision in the fascia to release the pressure in the compartment. Intensive care personnel will have to monitor the victim for kidney failure and a host of other issues. Wow. There's a limit to what you can do with a crushed victim in an earthquake without modern medical and surgical care. Besides the crush itself, fractures, sprains, and internal bleeding make this disaster a true challenge for the lone medic. This is Joe Alden, MD, that old Dr. Bones, wishing you the best of health in good times or bad. Thanks for watching. Hey, if you need a solid medical kit for that wilderness hike, hunting trip, or even long-term survival, check out Nurse Amy's entire line at store.doomandbloom.net. That's store.doomandbloom.net. You'll be glad you did.